North Berwick Christian Fellowship, a church based here in North Berwick, and we are delighted that you have come to join us this morning for some time together. Whether you live locally or further afield, we are just delighted that you've chosen to spend this time with us this morning. My name is Jo, and I'm going to be leading us through our service this morning. If you have any questions at all, or if you want to uh, chat, catch up, ask us anything, please do feel free to get in touch. You can email us if you would like, we'd love to hear from you. So as a church, we have a few different ways that you can connect with us. Maybe this is your first time watching, so I'm gonna run through the different ways that you can connect with us. We are a church family and our heart is connection. You can join us on Sundays, either in person or online. We meet online YouTube at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning, we put our content out. So don't forget to subs subscribe on YouTube. You can also sign up for our weekly email, NBCF Connect, and this has all the latest news and events and the life's, life of the church and all the goings on that's happening. It's a really great way to keep in touch with the church. I do have some good news for us this morning. I am absolutely thrilled and delighted to announce that we are going to be getting back into the high school to meet regularly once again. So from Sunday the 31st of October, we will be meeting weekly back into the high school, which is just the best news ever. Obviously, more details will follow, and with all things right now, everything, unfortunately, is subject to change if restrictions were to change. But right now, we're delighted. Sunday, 31st of October, we will be meeting back in the high school weekly. We will have more details to follow, so do keep tuned for that. And for our online viewers, we are going to continue to have an online service we are going to be reviewing the format for our online presence, so do keep post, do, do keep connected and keep watching for updates of that as, as, we, as we figure them out and as we announce them to you. So some really good news this morning. Today, we're going to have a short time of worship followed by a talk. First of all, we're going to come and have a time of worship just now. We come to worship you this morning, Lord. We once again, we still our hearts in your presence. We lift our eyes to you, God. We give you thanks for your faithfulness to us, for your great love for us. Psalm 16, verses five to 11. Say, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. God, I pray that all of us, as we come into your presence this morning, would be filled with your joy this morning, that we would know that as we stand with our eyes on you, that you standing next to us, being with us in your presence, that we will not be shaken. And this morning we will experience the fullness of your joy in your presence. We come to worship you this morning, Father. Amen. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not in desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. Jesus Christ, my living home. Who could imagine so great a mercy? 
what I could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior I'm yours forever my Jesus Christ my Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. no claim on me Then came the morning that sealed the promise Your buried body began to breathe Out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave no pain on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. And hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. We are living in unique times. As this global pandemic continues onwards, we're hopeful though things are gonna to continue to improve. We are gradually emerging. We are emerging from various lockdowns and learning again to do some of the things that are normal, but we took for granted. Go for a coffee, meet with family, see friends we haven't seen in years, perhaps for the brave, even going on holiday overseas. We still feel cautious at times though. How do we greet people now? When can we hug? Uh, when do we now do the famous elbow bump? And w will we ever be able to shake hands again? As a church, we are on the verge of getting back to meeting in person weekly, something we've been unable to do since March 2020. And that is a seriously long time. There's not been an event like this, at least in centuries. And all going well, we're going to be resuming meeting weekly at the end of October. 
As we approach this milestone, we felt it would be helpful to, in this next series, to look at the original emergence of the church. Perhaps in doing so, we can prepare our hearts and minds as we re-emerge as MBCF. What might God want to say to us, and how can we be ready for what God wants to do next? We're going to be studying the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, as it's often called. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking just at the first couple of chapters, which tell the story of the birth of the church. So a little historical background to the book first. Well, Acts is not a standalone book, but rather the much anticipated sequel to Luke's gospel. The author of both of them is Luke, and together these two manuscripts form more than a quarter of the New Testament. So Luke has only mentioned himself three times in the New Testament, and yet he's in third place for the most prolific authors in the whole of the Bible. He was a companion to the Apostle Paul. He was a Gentile, possibly the only Gentile author in the Bible, and he was trained as a doctor. Luke writes both his Gospel and Acts to provide a detailed historical account of Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection and ministry. He uses eyewitnesses and at times he is one himself. As an educated man, he seeks accuracy and integrity in all his writings. Both his works are addressed to someone called Theophilus. Uh, We don't know exactly who this is, but it is possible that he is a Roman official. Throughout Luke and Acts, he addresses the interplay between Rome as the governing power and Christianity. So let's begin by looking at this first chapter of Acts. I'll be giving us an overview of the key events that took place prior to the Holy Spirit being poured out at Pentecost. This is a period of preparation. So let's read Acts chapter 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. So here we have the introduction to this book and Luke refers back to his gospel and then links it to what he's going to share now. And he links it all with this fascinating phrase, all that Jesus began to do and teach. So Luke's gospel is where Jesus began and Acts is where he continues. There's no separation in his mind. It's not that Jesus had finished now and the focus was now going to be on building the church. Rather, it's that Jesus ministered before and now he continues that ministry, this time through the sending of the Spirit. So the church is very much the continuation of the ministry of Jesus. Jesus' ministry is not over in the story of in Acts, and it's not over for us today. Yes, Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, but his ministry had only begun. So Jesus began something 2,000 years ago that's still going on. We can't separate the work of the Spirit and the work of Jesus. We can't separate the ministry of Jesus before his death and resurrection and the ministry afterwards. They are all a continuation. So Luke mentions that there's this period uh, between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension. That's before he returns to his Father in heaven. And in this period, Jesus gives instruction to his disciples through the Spirit. The Spirit is already working before Pentecost through Jesus. But soon the Spirit will be given to them all. So there's this period of 40 days where Jesus having been resurrected, appears to his disciples. Not in vague and inconclusive ways, but in convincing ways, Luke says. He walks through walls and yet he sits and eats food with them. They can touch him and yet he can disappear. We learn that at one point he uh, reveals himself to 500 people at once and there's just no way they were all imagining this. In other words, it was strange but it was convincing. The people who saw Jesus were convinced, not least his disciples who were transformed from a fearful scattered group over these 40 days. And in this 40 day period, he instructs 
the disciples. His main topic? Well, it's the kingdom of God. The very thing that he announced at the start of his ministry is still the main thing. The rule and reign of God on earth is still the focus. The prayer he taught them to pray on earth as in heaven is still the call on their lives. Yes, the cross would make forgiveness possible through dealing with our sin, but that forgiveness was unto something. The cross invites us into the kingdom and calls us to be ambassadors of that kingdom. The kingdom is the big picture, it's the big mission. And it's in this period, it's as if Jesus is regathering his disciples. At his death, many of them were scattered and fearful. Even most of those who were closest to him disappeared when things got difficult. And yet he lovingly comes alongside them and draws them back in. We then get given the details of one of these conversations, reading in verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I love that this begins with them eating together, Jesus spending time with them. He enjoys their presence. They engage together. They relax and talk and share food together. It's a joyful picture for the disciples. Their friend and teacher is alive. And he repeats his instruction from before. Wait for the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. The experience is going to be like being baptized in water. In other words, they're going to be plunged in and immersed in the Holy Spirit. The disciples then ask a question that reveals something about the way they're thinking. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So honestly, the disciples still don't quite get it. Despite all that he has said, despite 40 days of resurrection appearances and talk of the kingdom, they're still thinking in the wrong categories. And they say at this time, there's a sense of kind of impatience. Okay, is it time now? It's a little bit like, you know, when the kids are in the back of the car and they're constantly asking, are we there yet? Well, they want Jesus to restore the kingdom to Israel. They're thinking politically and geographically. They have forgotten the words of Jesus. My kingdom is not of this world. So the disciples consistently get this wrong throughout Jesus's ministry. They want a king who's going to come in and depose the Romans and restore Israel to its former glory, a nation state that displays God to the world. Well, this is not Jesus's main plan. That was a stepping stone on the way to his kingdom coming more fully. Verse seven, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So on the timing, he basically says, don't worry about that, that's the Father's job. But you're about to have a mission that will keep you busy enough. I'm not restoring the kingdom to Israel as you imagine. Rather, I'm giving you my spirit and I will give you, that will give you the power to be my witness. This kingdom is not about political or geographical power. His plan is bigger than Israel. He's saying you will become witnesses to this good news of the kingdom. That will take you beyond the political boundaries you have in your mind. And this is ultimately about the whole world. Yes, the kingdom is coming, but you're still thinking in the wrong categories. The enemy is not Israel's neighboring states or even the Romans. It is sin, it is the world systems, and it is the devil. And perhaps... We, like the disciples, often fall into these, um, think, this thinking that, that we think in the wrong categories. God's kingdom is not of this world 
and our battle is not against flesh and blood. We need to avoid a kind of political or authority based approach to implementing the kingdom. Our authority comes from Jesus, not in our ability to win elections or enforce our beliefs on others within society. I've said it before, but I think the loss of cultural power that Christianity and the church has faced in our country is actually a good thing for our faith. Our methods are different. We love and we serve and we proclaim a saviour who died and, and rose again. It's foolishness, as Paul puts it. And sometimes we think we have ideas on how God can move in our world. But we need to ask ourselves, are, are we talking about the kingdom of God or are we talking of, about the kingdom of man? And sometimes we also fall into this trap of thinking about Christian nations. God is after a restored world, not a loyal political system. And reading on, we have the, what is called the ascension. Verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So this is the end of that 40 day period. Jesus returned to the Father in heaven. Now this is an unusual passage and many have tried to make it seem less odd by claiming it's not something we should take literally. After all, we know that heaven is not upward. In the truest sense, heaven is another dimension. It's as though it's all around us at any given time and space. Not a separate place that's distant and in the sky. And I think this is where we, um, as modern day readers, have to be careful not to be arrogant. I think the eyewitnesses to this event also knew that heaven was not in the sky. It was as strange to them as it is to us. The language used makes it clear that this is the best they could describe an event that was breaking categories for them. And the emphasis on their eyes, their sight, looking intently, looking into the sky, all make it clear that this is an eyewitness account, not a symbolic or a poetic explanation. So the significance of this event is, as Jesus has previously explained to his disciples, unless he returns to the Father, he could not send the Spirit. In his resurrection appearances, Jesus has already shown them that he can appear and disappear. So in this situation, he could have simply just vanished before them, but he didn't. So perhaps this scene is simply about marking something different, a change in season. And so then two men appear who are described in such a way, it becomes very clear that they are angels. Luke refers to angelic activity throughout his writings. So the men question, why are they looking into the sky? And quite honestly, I don't blame the disciples. I'd be looking too into the sky if that's what I'd just seen. But the angel explains, this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So what they've just seen is Jesus' return to heaven, the angel explains. The good news is that he's going to come back, however. This is what's referred to often as Jesus' second coming. And many have created all sorts of conjecture around this phrase, we'll come back in the same way. Well, the intention of this phrase here is not to say that Jesus will appear next time coming down the heavenly elevator out of a cloud, or even that he's going to come back on the Mount of Olives where this took place. We know from other scripture that when he returns, it's going to be visible to the whole world, not just a few people on a mountain. So the intention there is none of those little details, rather to simply make the claim that Jesus will be back. The season has changed. Jesus is in heaven and the spirit is about to be poured out. They need to recognize this change that has happened. They need to let go of the past and move to the future. When Jesus was with them on earth, they didn't want him to die. They clung to him. 
yet there was a greater purpose in mind. When Jesus is resurrected and appears to his disciples, they didn't want him to leave. They clung to him. They stood looking at the sky. And sometimes we can do the same. We want to cling to what God has been doing in one season. Perhaps we've seen God move powerfully in certain ways and we cling to it. Perhaps we find ourselves looking into the sky. In nearly every move of, hit of God in history, the people who most fiercely oppose it are those who experience the last move of God. It's a sad but true point. If what God does next doesn't look like what he's done before, are we okay with that? Can we discern God even when he shows up differently? Are we familiar with his character or just his current methods? And it's important that we don't stand looking at the sky. What God has done is amazing, but what he, when he's doing something new, we have to adapt. We want to be a people prepared to recognize what God is doing now, who can honor the past without getting stuck there. And if we're not careful, our past experiences of God can actually get in the way of our future experiences of God. So the angels ask the question, why do you look to the sky? So the disciples, they, they snap out of it and they head to Jerusalem to gather as instructed. So reading on in verse 12, then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So it's a 15 minute walk back to the city and they return to the room where they've been staying. Perhaps it's the room, the same upper room where they had that intimate final meal with Jesus before the cross, but we can't be sure. Luke lists all that are there and here we can see the impact of the last 40 days of Jesus's appearances. This scattered and fearful disciples have been regathered and they're joined by the women who have long supported and come alongside Jesus' ministry. Also, we have Jesus' direct family, his mother, but also his brothers, who were once skeptical, now at his side, convinced by his resurrection. So they now spend the next 10 days in prayer. It's what Jesus taught them to do, and it seems to be the natural response in these circumstances. You see, waiting in Jerusalem is not a passive thing. If God is asking you to wait, what will you do while you're waiting? Why not use that time in prayer? And they didn't just have a 10 minute prayer meeting at the start of each day. From the sounds of it, there was a constant prayer meeting going on. The room became a dedicated prayer room, a space of dedication and heartfelt communication with their father, people coming and going. And it would be fair to assume that part of that prayer that they prayed was for the spirit to come. It had been promised by Jesus, but they didn't just sit, kick back and relax in anticipation. They actually leaned in. And our response to the promises of God often reveal whether we really long to see them fulfilled or not. What promises has God given you? Have you just sit, sat back or are you leaning in? Just because he has promised it doesn't mean we don't have a role to play. And we now come to the part of this story just before Pentecost, which seems almost businesslike. Let's read it in verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language, Akeldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, 
let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. So in this context of prayer and waiting, they decide it's best to deal with the gap that Judas has left. Perhaps they realize the significance of having 12 apostles to represent the 12 tribes of Israel, or perhaps they simply think it's a good idea. But whatever the reasoning, it comes to Peter in the midst of an atmosphere of prayer that this is the thing to do. And already we see Peter taking a lead in this early church community. So Jesus has opened their minds to understand scripture. And since the resurrection, they've been revisiting the Old Testament with new perspective. And Peter now sees two scriptures from the Psalms as confirmation that they should replace Judas. There's a general agreement and they decide on a set of criteria and find two candidates. They then cast lots, which is an Old Testament tradition, for hearing from God and Matthias is selected. I find this whole section fascinating for a number of reasons. Firstly, this is almost like the very first church business meeting. And here we see the deeply spiritual and the deeply practical coming together. There are times to pray and there are times to get the right leaders in place for what is coming next. The practical and the spiritual are not separate, they flow together. It seems like Peter does what he thinks is best and everyone else agrees. The practical and the spiritual flow together in the way that they select Jesus' replacement. So they drop criteria, someone who's been a witness throughout, an eyewitness, someone who can represent Jesus to the world. They then narrow it down and then they cast lots. Now this seems a bit random to us, a little bit like throwing dice. Yet it is a common approach for making decisions in the Old Testament. It is their way of leaving the decision to God. And a few commentators point out, now that we have the Spirit, we don't need these methods. Not to say that God can't use them. I mean, how many times have I heard of someone uh, opening their Bible at a random place and that verse speaking directly into their circumstances? But I would not recommend Bible bingo as a form of hearing from God. What they do, though, in this decision is important. They bring together common sense and an openness to God's voice. And that is a great way to make decisions. And as we prepare ourselves for this next season, perhaps we ought to do the same. As we look to emerge, to see us grow and become all that God has for us in this season, we need to use our common sense to make decisions that seem practical whilst asking God to direct us in key moments. And making decisions in an atmosphere of prayer is another great idea. It's so often that when we dedicate space and time to God, that he can get our attention. And when I think back to our decision come to coming here to lead NBCF, it was a decision that we made through prayer and the practicalities. For us, it was a journey of a couple of years of listening and praying. We asked God to speak. We wrote down the pictures and the words that he gave us. We didn't always understand what they meant, but we wrote it down if it felt significant. And sometimes it took the form of a scripture that came to mind. And sometimes a picture in our imaginations. Sometimes we had dreams that felt significant. And we gathered all of these together. We also spoke with other wise people in our lives. We shared what was on our hearts and what God had been showing us. They were able to help us understand what God might be saying and also knowing us what would fit for us. There were also the practical considerations. Could we afford to move to North Berwick? And how would we sort out the girls with nursery and school and all of that good stuff? 
So the practical and the spiritual combined into a decision-making process that involved others. And hearing God together and discerning his will through common sense and prayer. And our decisions going forward as a church are not purely mechanical. They must be spirit-led. And a church in preparation is a church in prayer, ready to receive what God has for us next. So that brings us to the end of this chapter of Acts chapter 1. Next week we get to look at the, 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 the spirit coming, the, the peace they've been preparing for. But this first chapter, this is, a, this is a phase of preparation. Jesus preparing his disciples by sharing about the kingdom of God, convincing them he is alive, then returning to the Father in preparation for the spirit being poured out. The disciples are preparing their hearts and minds in prayer and also organizing themselves practically for what is to come. And everything is now poised for what will come next, the coming of the Spirit. We have looked at preparation. Next week, we will look at power. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. And we thank you for what we learn in it today. We thank you for this season of preparation that you had for the disciples before your spirit came. And God, I pray if there's things from this you want to highlight to us as individuals and as a church, that you would make that clear to us. And God, I pray that you would call us to prayer. Call us to that upper room, that place where we are open to what you want to say to us. But also help us to use our common sense as we make decisions and move forward. God, we ask that you would prepare our hearts and our minds in this season. Amen. Thank you, Neil. A really great message for us this morning. And thank you for joining us. It's been so, so great to have you with us. And if you do want to find out more, then please do email us to get in touch or you can find us on social media as well. We would just love to connect with you. We're going to be back here again next week and we hope to see you then. Remember, if you don't want to miss out, do hit that subscribe button so you can get notifications of future content. We are praying for you, that you have an abundantly blessed week, that you know the riches of his presence in everything that you do. We're delighted that you've joined us and we look forward to seeing you again.